If there's one fictional hero who can't resist the call of adventure, it's the red-haired legend, Adel Kristen. Through his travelogues, we only know a fraction of his adventures, but each is bursting with intrigue, often involving halting some form of cataclysm. This same pattern applies to the latest entry, East 10 Nordics, a highly unorthodox and refreshing outing for numerous reasons, partly because it's one of Adel's earliest adventures to date. Now, shout forth the name of our god! Huh? It can't be! Taking place about a month after Adel's quests in Asteria and the floating islands of East and East 1 and East 2, East 10 Nordics is now the third chronological title in the series. At 17 years old, Adel is still a fresh-faced adventurer. He's on his way to the land of Selseta with his new companion Dogi and Dr. Flair from the Lance Village in the Kingdom of East. However, the trio becomes involved in a large-scale conflict in the Obelia Gulf between two factions, the Normans and the Greiger. Karja Balta, known as the Pirate Princess, is one of the Normans, which is a pretty intimidating group of seafaring warriors. Well, she becomes attached to Adel, quite literally. A pair of magical cuffs ties the two together, forcing them to stay close at all times. Meanwhile, the Greiger are seemingly mortal monsters led by humanoids, and they're currently taking the Obelia Gulf by storm, leading to all-out war. Adel and Karja are among the few capable of putting a dent in their forces as they're blessed with mana, which is currently the only thing that's able to affect the Grigor's immortality. While the East series isn't usually celebrated for its narrative, East 10 Nordic stands out as one of the best, being my favorite next to East 9's story. East 9 benefited highly from knowledge of the previous games, featuring the franchise's best party and providing an intricate story study of Adol himself that felt transcendental. East 10 doesn't quite reach those heights, but it thrives on the compelling bond between its leads, Adol and Karja. Their relationship grows naturally, rooted in sibling-like camaraderie rather than overt romantic inclinations, a refreshing change from Adol's usual tendencies to unconsciously attract the opposite sex. Karja is undoubtedly the best female lead in the franchise thanks to her constant presence, which builds genuine endearment. She begins as rather insensitive towards Adol and company, but her insecurities and backstory are gradually unveiled, resulting in one of the most multifaceted characters in the series. The rest of the central cast exhibit similar strengths, though to lesser extents. Their arcs may be somewhat trope-filled, but they complement each other excellently, and the believable bonds among the youths of Karnak are a highlight. East 10 Nordic's narrative also excels with its tone, eventually boasting a constant nerve-wracking tension that permeates the second half of East 7 and the entirety of East 9. Hold it! I see something! Huh? It looks like a building! Even as Adol begins to make a name for himself, such as Karja's dad being aware of his bringing down Asteria's Stormwall, he's still a budding adventurer. The stakes imposed by the humanoid Gregor are severe, emphasized by Adol's youths. Playing a new East release set around the time of the first two games is a bizarre yet welcome sensation that gives this period appreciated limelight. The villains in East 10 are probably the best the series has seen since the personal struggle in Oath and Felgana. The Gregor leaders are distinctive in their personalities despite their seemingly shared ambition, and every scene they're in is memorable. They have a more of a connection to Adol and Karja than expected, making their eventual confrontations worthwhile. I hope this improvement in antagonist quality continues in future entries. Another layer of East 10 story is Adol's dreamlike scenarios. Seemingly out of nowhere, whether in the middle of a cutscene or after finding a key item, Adol's consciousness drifts into an eerily tranquil island. Here, he befriends an elderly amnesiac man, and the two bond as Adol tries to help him regain his memory. Ironically, Adol has an undefined and fluctuating time limit during each visit, and he doesn't retain memories of this place or the elderly man after he's whisked back to reality. This structure is similar to the solo Donna segments in East 8 and Adol's prison segments in East 9. As someone who preferred the prison sections of East 9 due to the inherent shift in gameplay identity and tone that established well-communicated peril, East 10 solo segments stand in the middle ground between East 8 and East 9. Besides the ethereal atmosphere, 
distinct from the main game, Addle Solo Ventures also serve as tutorials for the exploration tools that you require, which we'll discuss later. I still prefer East 9's take on these individual outings, but East 10's iteration is at least less taxing than East 8's, which felt needlessly dragged out within the vast dungeon. In the opening hours, you gain access to your ship, the Sandras, which gradually fills with various crewmates and citizens that you save. The more permanent fixtures, comprised of townspeople from Karnak, receive significant focus, surpassing the extended cast seen in East 8 and East 9. A notable drive towards these strengths results from the returning affinity event system from those games. By giving gifts or completing particular gameplay milestones, you uncover previously hidden motivations and characterizations that deepen these characters. Speaking of returning systems, East 10 is a mix of old and new that feels revitalizing after four games of similar structures. The major change is the lack of a full party. Instead, only Adel and Karja are playable with the new cross-action system. You can swap between two modes during combat, duo, and solo. Duo mode, activated by holding R2, has Adel and Karja perform attacks together at the expense of swing speed and agility while moving. Solo mode is comparable to previous titles, allowing you to swap between controlling Adel and Karja on the fly. They both have their own array of learnable skills and team attacks. Interestingly, East 10 focuses more on defensive maneuvers, with a guard activated by the same buttons that unties Adel and Karja. This leads to a new feature, the Revenge Gauge. This mechanic relies on perfectly guarding incoming attacks to build up a multiplier. Then, activating a skill in dual mode will deal multiplicative damage based on the accumulated percentage from guarding. Your strategies against bosses will typically involve building up a revenge gauge and unleashing it with a duo skill. Several additional elements add depth to the combat loop. Your revenge gauge multiplier cap is upgradable, connected to collectibles and discoveries, ultimately allowing you to deal up to 5 times the base damage with dual skills. And not every attack can be guarded. Those with blue coloring can only be evaded by dashing into them, which is an ingrained factor you may have to adjust to. Another crucial facet of combat progression is the new leveling structure called the release line. While traditional experience-based leveling remains alongside learning new skills through proficiency and finding manuals, the release line is a fresh concept for the series. It's a vast grid with two sides for Adel and Karja expanded as they level up. This grid is connected through blank nodes where you input items called mind gems and you can earn several passive boons depending on your assortment. Different mind gem types are indicated by their color and connecting multiples of the same color enhances their capabilities. For example, red mind gems prioritize raw attack gain, while blue mind gems enhance the efficacy of mana skills. You also have rainbow mind gems that excel in all general areas except the dark attribute. The release line is one of the most satisfying upgrade systems that I've seen, allowing for many builds with little frustration thanks to the ease of removing and replacing slots. Plus, you can access and customize your release line no matter where you are. Continuing with combat, Adel and Karja have unique charge attacks with fire and ice elemental properties respectively. Besides boasting a circular range, they can influence burn and free status elements. Many accessories encourage utilizing these effects, giving the charge attacks multiple layers beyond their range and efficacy as combo finishers. The charge strikes also affect the environment. Adel can burn wooded barriers, blocking paths, while Karja can create frozen platforms on water surfaces. Without exaggeration, East 10 has one of my favorite action combat systems ever conceived, bolstered by stellar boss designs that come close to matching the quality of East the Oath of Falgana and East Origin. However, the difficulty is a little too lenient here, chiefly due to the generously perfect guarding windows preventing the boss battles from reaching those game's heights. Despite being a step up from some of the other titles, this entry still feels too easy on its Nightmare and Inferno difficulties. I completed two separate playthroughs on those modes, and although there were a few spikes, which is more than I can say from the past games, the challenge never quite felt sufficient. Still, the weight and movement of the combat made every encounter thrilling. The lack of punishing difficulty didn't impede my enjoyment. I immediately clicked with the gameplay to an extent I can only compare to my history with the Kingdom Hearts games. East 10's combat weight is so intuitive that it only took minutes before everything became second nature. It was so addictive that even two full playthroughs back to back weren't enough, leading me to experience the time attack and boss rush modes. You. Go, Doctor! 
The other central aspect of East 10's gameplay revolves around exploration, divided between land and sea travel. Surpassing every previous East game in scope, you have complete control over your ship, the Sandras, as you traverse the Gulf. Unfortunately, the marketing hasn't adequately highlighted the ship's gameplay, and I expected the demo to provide a similarly poor showcase. The major fault with the ship implementation, and really the only real negative point I have, is how long it takes for its strengths to really open up. Initially, you can only slowly steer the ship on the open waters with only a single wind boost and nothing else. Mana streams enhance sailing speed and refill the boost meter, but it's still too gradual. Eventually, you can upgrade various facets of the ship, including its boost capabilities, damage outputs, and weapon types. However, the most crucial aspect, which is speed, should have been boosted from the very beginning. While the gradual growth illustrates your accomplishments, a better balance should have been struck. Regardless, ship navigation undeniably embraces adventure and has been implemented splendidly. The general feel of movement and combat is comparable to the Caribbean world of Kingdom Hearts 3, allowing you to fire cannons and other weapon types with their own cooldown times. You gain a barrier that can be turned on and off at will with other functionalities that become more enjoyable later in the game. Ship battles are a genuine thrill, bolstered by the ability to board select ships mid-battle and defeat occupants in typical combat. Above all, you must be patient for your vessel's capabilities to unfold. The ship captures replace the raids from East 8 and East 9, but they are a well-paced addition. These captures are divided into two halves. First, eliminating barriers while enemy ships patrol the area. Second, landing on the protected island to engage in combat and navigational trials. You can gain additional boons in the second half depending on your performance in the ship segments. Ultimately, the ranking system of these captures isn't as strict as it should be, since you can achieve S ranks without accumulating many bonuses. However, you still need to be swift and defeat most, if not all, enemies on land. What stands out most is that these raids never overstay their welcome and are relatively sporadic, unlike the overly frequent raids in East. 8. Beyond ship captures, I was amazed by how much there is to do at sea. You can discover optional islands, encounter notable wildlife, follow treasure maps, engage in tuna fishing, meet merchant ships, and more. These activities aren't overly reoccurring either, making ocean traversal continuously delightful. I also appreciated the new crew conversations that you can activate as you travel. The core crew, comprised of the youth of Karnak, received substantial focus that showcases their shared histories and friendships magnificently. Various lore, about the Obelia Gulf region and beyond is also shared, ensuring each trip is eventful. Moreover, the ship can be explored on foot and has numerous facilities unlocked as characters are recruited. Between ship upgrading, shops, cooking, and reporting accolades, there's always a task to complete here. Lana exploration is equally engaging, featuring a compelling movement system rooted in the mana tools that you acquire. For instance, the Golan Board is a device that you can ride at any time. It's momentum-based, moving faster downhill and slower uphill. This feature alone is phenomenal because the speed you can gain feels transcendent, letting you soar past obstacles and platforms if aimed correctly. Other mana abilities include a hookshot-like device and a monocle similar to the Mask of Eyes from the previous entries, letting you scan for enemies in critical areas of interest and even briefly stop time. You'll use the monocle frequently since every explorable area has hidden treasures detectable only when it's active. This continuous sense of discovery, coupled with treasured maps found at sea, makes East 10 feel like the most adventurous outing yet, fishing returns and works a lot like in East 8, with Carjo or Addle supporting you when a related gauge is full. Multiple bait types are available, and it's a pleasing pastime made convenient. At fishing spots, bait guaranteed to provide a new catch is marked with an exclamation mark. If you're seeking new fish, you won't have to waste time. Moving on, East 10 is transparent with its side quests. Similar to recent entries, thanks to the deadline timeframes indicating urgency, these tasks are diverse, such as slaying monsters or eating townsfolk in specific ways. The rewards are worthwhile, and many help build the sense of community among the Normans, Karnak dwellers, and other villagers. Soundtrack quality is always a topic of debate among dedicated Falcom fans. 
fans, and East 10 will likely fuel that discussion. I've found the developer soundtrack quality has dipped since post Cold Steel 2, but I've still mostly enjoyed the output. East 10 doesn't reach the caliber of Lacrimosa of Donna or some of the other titles, but I'd say it's at least of the standards of East 9, which I still enjoyed. There is a noticeable lack of variety in the track's tones as well. In terms of localization, East 10 is proficient despite a handful of minor hiccups. There were also a few cutscenes that lacked English subtitles, but aside from that, I had no issues with the PS5 performance or my experience. I can't emphasize enough how much I fell in love with East 10 Nordics. The captivating, tense narrative, stellar cast, and gripping new gameplay systems all coalesce to create an adventure that easily surpasses many of the series' previous heights. Now standing as my third favorite entry in the franchise behind East Origin and East The Oath of Felghana, East 10 Nordics is a new modern Falcom classic and a testament to the series' continued growth. Regardless of your history with East, this is an ideal jumping on point for new players and veteran fans alike, instilling a sense of scope the developer has never before explored. And considering the secret optional scene in the epilogue that encourages theory crafting, it's anyone's guess where the next entry will go. Still, I know for sure that I want to see the cross-action system return and evolve. Noisy Pixel is giving East 10 Nordics a 9.5 out of 10. Thanks for watching. This video is brought to you by your supporters on Patreon. Noisy Pixel is run by a group of gamers providing independent gaming coverage through news, reviews, previews, and more. Check out our Patreon to help support our continued growth and subscribe to keep up with all our future content. <laughs> Noisy pixel.